Hello and welcome to this short video which will introduce you to the Netbox REST API. Once again, we'll be using the public demo instance of Netbox which is freely available to use at demo.netbox.dev. There are a couple of links to start exploring the REST API that you can find in the footer of the web interface. The first one allows you to explore the API via a web browser and takes you to its root at forward slash API. By clicking on that link, we made a GET request to the API root, and from the JSON output in red, we can clearly see the API endpoint hierarchy. And at the root level, the URLs are divided by application. And these should be familiar now after the previous video where we explored the web interface. So they go from circuits all the way down to wireless. And if we click on the URL for the circuits application, we can see the separate paths for each model. For example, if we want to explore the providers model, we click on the URL, which performs the get request to the API forward slash circuits forward slash providers endpoint, and the JSON response returns a list of all the providers. Each model has two types of views associated with it, a list view and a detail view. And what we're looking at here is the list view of the providers model, which lists multiple objects in the JSON output. The list view is also used to create new objects via the REST API. In this case, the JSON output from the GET request returns a list of nine providers, and in the results part of the JSON output, we can see each provider. ID number one here is the object for AT&T, and if we click the URL, it will take us to the detail view for this object. The detail view allows you to retrieve, update, or delete a single existing object. As you will note here again, all objects are referenced by their numeric primary key. In this case, the key is ID and the value is one. Note also how you can see that the full path of the get request is now API forward slash circuits forward slash providers forward slash one. So by using this tool to manually navigate the API in this way, you get a clear understanding of the hierarchical structure of the API and the endpoints within it. Okay, so if we navigate back to the web interface, the other REST API hyperlink in the footer takes you to interactive documentation of all the REST API endpoints at API forward slash docs. This interface provides a convenient sandbox for researching and experimenting with the specific endpoints and request types. So let's use the providers example again. And if we scroll down to the circuits and providers endpoint, we can see the API request types that are available to us. If we click on the get request type and then click on try it out, and then scroll down and click on execute without specifying any options we then see a few different things in the response first of all we see the curl command that has been generated for us to make the api call so this is really useful as it shows you how to construct the curl request so you could copy and paste this into your terminal program and run the curl command yourself then we see the request url which as we know is api slash circuits slash providers and then we see the actual response from the server. The status code of 200, which means the API call was successful. And then we can see the full JSON output in the response body. Further down, we have the response headers and the request duration tells us how many milliseconds the request took to complete. If we review the JSON output, we see that it is the same output that we saw previously with a count of nine providers returned in the list view. Okay, so let's try and filter the output of the detail view for one of the specific providers. And we can do that easily. If we scroll back up, we can see that we can test out query strings in the API calls. So let's go ahead and do that. Remember that each object can be referenced by its numeric primary key. So if we add the ID of one to the query and then execute it again, note that the request URL is now different as it contains the added query parameter of question mark ID equals one. And then in the response body, we can see that we now have the detail view for this provider, AT&T. So now you might be thinking, hmm, okay, this is great, but how about we try adding a new provider via the API? Well, let's work out how to do that by scrolling down the list of available request types. And here we have the post type, which is the function of creating a new provider. So let's click try it out. Then if we click on the model, the first thing to note is that for the provider model, there are two required fields, name and slug. So these are needed as a bare minimum for the request to be a success. So let's edit the body and remove all of the fields apart from the name and slug, which we will edit to be our new awesome provider. Okay, now we'll click on execute and let's see what happens. First of all, the response code is 201. 
which means the request has succeeded and has led to the creation of a resource. Then if we look at the response body, we see that we have an ID of 11 and the name and slug of our new provider. Okay, so let's check in the web interface and confirm what we did. And we click on circuits and providers and sure enough, we see our new awesome provider in the list. Fantastic. As we didn't add any other information as part of the request to set up the provider, let's make another API call to update it with a customer portal URL. First of all, let's work out how to construct our new API call from the documentation. Scroll down and check the available request types for the circuit slash providers endpoint. We can see that the patch request will do a partial update and it takes the ID of the provider that we want to update. So that sounds like what we need. Now, as we've seen, the documentation is a great way to test interacting with the API, but let's take it a step further and use a tool called Postman to do the update. If you're not familiar with it, Postman is an API platform tool for building and using APIs, and is a great way to interact with the Netbox APIs. This is the Postman interface, and here we have an API request that I've already created, and I've given it the name of Update Provider. The request type is patch, and you can see from the dropdown that you can select other types from here also. Note the URL containing the full path to the endpoint, including the ID of the provider we're going to update, which had an ID of 11. Then you can see we have added some headers to the API call, which specifies the content type as JSON, and also includes an authorization token, which is required to authenticate to Netbox via the API. And we'll cover tokens in a later module in more detail. Next up, we have the body of the request, which contains the actual JSON payload that we're going to send in the API call. The field we're updating is the portal underscore URL, and we will give it the value of support.awesomeprovider.com. Okay, so that's our API call built, so let's click send and take a look at the output. Firstly, the status code is 200, so all good there. And in the JSON response back from the server, we can see that provider ID 11 has been updated, which is great. So if we switch back to the UI and hit refresh, we can see our newly added customer portal URL. So far, so good. So lastly, let's say that this provider has turned out to be not quite as awesome as we'd hoped for, and we're no longer going to use them for any of our circuits. Let's make another API call to delete this provider. From the API docs, we can see that the delete request type is available, and it takes the ID of the provider in the path again. So back in Postman, let's duplicate our first API call and amend it slightly. We'll call this one delete provider and change the request type to delete. And then we clear the body of the JSON as we don't need it for this call. And then we can save it for future use in the collection of API calls that we're building in Postman. Now, in a production setup where you are programmatically interacting with Netbox, it would be more realistic to be sending the ID of the provider you're deleting as a variable in some code that is making the API call. Well, Postman lets you set variables too. So if we double click on the ID value of 11 and then click set as variable, give it the name provider underscore ID, leave the initial value as 11 and set the scope to be the collection of Netbox API calls and then set the variable. If we now check the collection and under variables, we can see it is set there and we can make use of it in our API call now. So that's all good. And we will just click send to make the API call to Netbox. This gives us a status code of 204, which means the server has successfully processed the request, but is not returning any content, which makes sense. I'll just show you one other very nice feature of Postman while we are in it. And that is if you click on the code icon on the right hand side, it will generate the code in whatever language you would like it. In this case, it's Python, as that's what I selected last time I used it, but you can change this to whatever you need, curl, for example, or even go. And then you can copy and paste this into your own scripts and code as you start to build your own tools to interact programmatically with the Netbox API. Okay, so the last thing we will do is switch back to the web interface and check that the list of providers has now been updated and the provider has been deleted and we click on providers, and sure enough, our not so awesome provider is no longer in the list view. So I hope that's been a useful introduction to the Netbox REST API, and hopefully you can see how you can very quickly and very easily get up and running with it. Thanks for watching.